Chapter Seven of The Door Through Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. The Door Through Space by Marion Zimmer Bradley. Chapter Seven. Shainsa, first, in the chain of dry towns that lie in the bed of a long dried ocean, is set at the centre of a great alkali plain, a dusty, parched city, bleached by a million years of sun. The houses are high, spreading buildings with many rooms and wide windows. The poorer sort were made of sun-dried brick, the more imposing being cut from the bleached salt stone of the cliffs that rise behind the city. News travels fast in the dry towns. If Rakal were in the city, he'd soon know that I was here, and guess who I was, or why I'd come. I might disguise myself so that my own sister, or the mother who bore me, would not know me, but I had no illusions about my ability to disguise myself from Rakal. He had created the disguise that was me. When the second sun sat red and burning behind the salt cliffs, I knew he was not in Shane Sa, but I stayed on, waiting for something to happen. At night I slept in a cubbyhole behind a wine-shop, paying an inordinate price for that very dubious privilege. And every day, in the sleepy silence of the blood-red noon, I paced the public square of Shane Sa. This went on for four days. No one took the slightest notice of another nameless man in a shabby shirt-cloak, without name or identity or known business. No one appeared to see me except the dusty children, with pale, fleecy hair, who played their patient games on the wind-swept curbing of the square. They surveyed my scarred face with neither curiosity or fear, and it occurred to me that Rindy might be such another as these. If I had still been thinking like an earthman, I might have tried to question one of the children, or win their confidence. But I had a deeper game in hand. On the fifth day I was so much a fixture that my pacing went unnoticed even by the children. On the grey moss of the square a few dried-looking old men, their faces as faded as their shirt-cloaks and bearing the knife-scars of a hundred forgotten flights, drowsed on the stone benches. And along the flagged walk at the edge of the square, as suddenly as an autumn storm in the salt-flats, a woman came walking. She was tall, with a proud swinging walk, and a metallic clashing kept rhythm to her swift steps. Her arms were fettered each wrist bound with a jewelled bracelet, and the bracelets linked together by a long, silver-gilt chain passed through a silken loop at her waist. From the loop swung a tiny golden padlock, but in the lock stood an even tinier key, signifying that she was a higher caste than her husband or consort, and that her fettering was by choice, and not command. She stopped directly before me, and raised her arm in formal greeting like a man. The chain made a tinkling sound in the hushed square, as her other hand was pulled up tight against the silken loop at her waist. She stood surveying me for a few moments, and finally I raised my head and returned her gaze. I don't know why I had expected her to have hair like spun black glass and eyes that burned with the red reflection of the burning star. This woman's eyes were darker than the poison berries of the salt cliffs, and her mouth was a cut berry that looked just as dangerous. She was young. The slimness of her shoulders and the narrow steel-chained wrists told me how very young she was. But her face had seen weather and storms, and her dark eyes had weathered worse psychic storms than that. She did not flinch at the sight of my scars, and met my gaze without dropping her eyes. "'You are a stranger. What is your business in Shainsa?' I met the direct question with the insolence it demanded, hardly moving my lips. I have come to buy women for the brothels of Ardkaran. Perhaps when washed you might be suitable. Who could arrange for your sale?" She took the rebuke impassively, though the bitter crimson of her mouth twitched a little in mischief, or rage. But she made no sign. The battle was joined between us, and I knew already that it would be fought to the end. From somewhere in her draperies something fell to the ground with a little tinkle. But I knew that trick, too, and I did not move. Finally she went away without bending to retrieve it, and when I looked around I saw that all the fleece-haired children had stolen away, leaving their playthings lying on the curb. But one or two of the gaffers on the stone benches, who were old enough to show curiosity without losing face, were watching me with impassive eyes. I could have asked the woman's name then, but I held back, knowing it could only lessen the prestige I had gained from the encounter. I glanced down, without seeming to do so, at the tiny mirror which had fallen from the recesses of the fur robe. Her name might have been inscribed on the reverse. 
but I left it lying there to be picked up by the children when they returned, and went back to the wine-shop. I had accomplished my first objective. If you can't be inconspicuous, be so damned conspicuous that nobody can miss you. And that, in itself, is a fair concealment. How many people can accurately describe a street riot? I was finishing off a bad meal with a stone bottle of worse wine when the chalk came in, disregarding the proprietor, and made straight for me. He was furred immaculately white, his velvet muzzle was contracted, as if the very smells might soil it, and he kept a dainty paw outstretched to ward off accidental contact with greasy counters or tables or tapestries. His fur was scented, and his throat circled with a collar of embroidered silk. This pampered minion surveyed me with the innocent malice of an uninvolved non-human for merely human intrigues. "'You are wanted in the great house of Shanithath, guard man,' he spoke the Shainsaw dialect with an affected lisp. "'Will it please you to come with me?' I came, with no more than polite protest, but was startled. I had not expected the encounter to reach the great house so soon. Shainsaw's great house had changed hands four times since I had last been in Shainsaw. I wasn't overly anxious to appear there. The white chalk, as out of place in the rough dry town as a jewel in the streets, or a raindrop in the desert, led me along a winding boulevard to an outlying district. He made no attempt to engage me in conversation, and, indeed, I got the distinct impression that this coxcomb of a non-human considered me well beneath his notice. He seemed much more aware of the blowing dust in the street which ruffled and smudged his carefully combed fur. The great house was carved from blocks of rough pink basalt, the entry guarded by two great caryatids and wrapped in chains of carved metal, set, somehow, into the surface of the basalt. The gilt had long ago worn away from the chains, so that it alternately gleamed gold or smudged base metal. The caryatids were patient and blind, their jewel eyes long vanished under a hotter sun than today's. The entrance hall was enormous. A Terran starship could have stood upright inside it, was my first impression, but I dismissed that thought quickly. Any Terran thought was apt to betray me. But the main hall was built on a scale even more huge, and it was even colder than the legendary hell of the Chalks. It was far too big for the people in it. There was a little solar heater in the ceiling, but it didn't help much. A dim glow came from a metal brazier, but that didn't help much either. The chalk melted into the shadows, and I went down the steps into the hall by myself, feeling carefully for each step with my feet, and trying not to seem to be doing so. My comparative night-blindness is the only significant way in which I really differ from a native wolfen. There were three men, two women, and a child in the room. They were all dry-towners, and had an obscure family likeness, and they all wore rich garments of fur dyed in many colors. One of the men, old and stooped and withered, was doing something to the brazier. A slim boy of fourteen was sitting cross-legged on a pile of cushions in the corner. There was something wrong with his legs. A girl of ten, in a too short smock that showed long, spider-thin legs above her low leather boots, was playing with some sort of shimmery crystals, spilling them out into patterns and scooping them up again from the uneven stones of the floor. One of the women was a fat, creased slattern, whose jewels and dyed furs did not disguise her greasy slovenliness. Her hands were unchained, and she was biting into a fruit which dripped red juice down the rich blue fur of her robe. The old man gave her a look like murder as I came in, and she straightened slightly, but did not discard the fruit. The whole room had a curious look of austere, dignified poverty, to which the fat woman was the only discordant note. But it was the remaining man and woman who drew my attention, so that I noticed the others only peripherally in their outermost orbit. One was Kiral, standing at the foot of the dais and glowering at me. The other was the dark-eyed woman I had rebuked to-day in the public square. Kiral said, "'So it's you,' and his voice held nothing. Not rebuke, not friendliness or lack of it, not even hatred. Nothing. There was only one way to meet it. I faced the girl." She was sitting on a throne-like chair next to the fat woman, and looked like a doe next to a pig, and said boldly, "'I assume this summons to mean that you informed your kinsman of my offer.' She flushed, and that was triumph enough. I held back the triumph, however, worry of overconfidence. The gaffer laughed the high cackle of age, and Kiral broke in with a sharp, angry monosyllable, by which I knew that my remark had indeed been repeated, and had lost nothing in the telling." but only the line of his jaw betrayed the anger as he said calmly, "'Be quiet, Delisa. Where did you pick this up?' I said boldly. 
The great house has changed rulers since last I smelled the salt cliffs. Newcomers do not know my name, and theirs is unknown to me. The old gaffer said thinly to Kural, Our name has lost Kirhar. One daughter is lured away by the toy-maker, and another babbles with strangers in the square, and a homeless no good of the streets does not know our name. My eyes, growing accustomed to the dark blaze of the brazier, saw that Kiral was biting his lip and scowling. Then he gestured to a table where an array of glassware was set, and at the gesture the white chalk came on noiseless feet and poured wine. "'If you have no blood feud with my family, will you drink with me?' "'I will,' I said, relaxing. Even if he had associated the traitor with the scarred earthmen of the spaceport, he seemed to have decided to drop the matter. He seemed startled, but he waited until I had lifted the glass and taken a sip. Then, with a movement like lightning, he leaped from the dais and struck the glass from my lips. I staggered back, wiping my cut mouth, in a split second juggling possibilities. The insult was terrible, and deadly. I could do nothing now but fight. Men had been murdered in Shainsaw for far less. I had come to settle one feud, not involve myself in another, but even while these lightning thoughts flickered in my mind, I had whipped out my skein and I was surprised at the shrillness of my own voice. "'You contrive a fence beneath your own roof!' "'Spy and renegade!' Kiral thundered. He did not touch his skein. From the table he caught a long, four-thonged whip, making it whistle through the air. The long-legged child scuttled backward. I stepped back one pace, trying to conceal my desperate puzzlement. I could not guess what had prompted Kiral's attack, but whatever it was, I must have made some bad mistake and could count myself lucky to get out of there alive. Kiral's voice perceptibly trembled with rage. "'You dare to come into my own home after I have tracked you to the Kharsa and back, blind fool that I was! But now you shall pay!' The whip sang through the air, hissing past my shoulders. I dodged to one side, retreating step by step as Kiral swung the powerful thongs. It cracked again, and a pain like the burning of red-hot iron seared my upper arm. My skein rattled down from numb fingers. The whip whacked the floor. "'Pick up your skein,' said Kiral. "'Pick it up if you dare!' He poised the lash again. The fat woman screamed. I stood rigid, gauging my chances of disarming him with a sudden leap. Suddenly the girl, Dalisa, leaped from her seat with a harsh musical chiming of chains. Kiral, no! No, Kiral! He moved slightly, but did not take his eyes from me. Get back, Dalisa! No, wait! She ran to him and caught his whip arm, dragging it down, and spoke to him hurriedly and urgently. Kiral's face changed as she spoke. He drew a long breath and threw the whip down beside my skein on the floor. Answer straight on your life. What are you doing in Shainsa? I could hardly take it in that for the moment I was reprieved from sudden death, from being beaten into bloody death here at Carol's feet. The girl went back to her throne-like chair. Now I must either tell the truth or a convincing lie, and I was lost in a game where I didn't know the rules. The explanation I thought might get me out alive might be the very one which would bring down instant and painful death. Suddenly, with a poignancy that was almost pain, I wished Rakal were standing here at my side. But I had to bluff it out alone. If they had recognized me for Race Cargill, the Terran spy who had often been in Shainsa, they might release me. It was possible, I supposed, that they were Terran sympathizers. On the other hand, Kiral's shouts of spy, renegade, seemed to suggest the opposite. I stood, trying to ignore the searing pain in my lashed arm, but I knew that blood was running hot down my shoulder. Finally I said— I came to settle blood feud. Kiral's lips thinned in what might have been meant for a smile. You shall, assuredly, but with whom remains to be seen. Knowing I had nothing more to lose, I said, with a renegade called Rakal Sensar. Only the old man echoed my words dully. Rakal Sensar. I felt heartened, seeing I wasn't dead yet. I have sworn to kill him. Kiral suddenly clapped his hands and shouted to the white chuck to clean up the broken glass on the floor. He said huskily, "'You are not yourself, recall Sensar.' "'I told you he wasn't,' said Dalisa, high and hysterical. "'I told you he wasn't!' A scarred man, tall. What was I to think? Kiral sounded and looked badly shaken. He filled a glass himself and handed it to me, saying hoarsely, "'I did not believe even the renegade recall would break the code so far as to drink with me.' He would not. I could be positive about this. The codes of Terra had made some superficial impress on Rakal, but down deep his own world held sway. If these men were at blood feud with Rakal, and he stood here where I stood, he would have let himself be beaten into bloody rags before tasting their wine. I took the glass, raised it, and drained it. Then, holding it out for more, I said, "'Rakal's life is mine. 
but I swear by the red star and by the unmoving mountains, by the black snow and by the ghost wind, I have no quarrel with any beneath this roof. I cast the glass to the floor where it shattered on the stones. Kiral hesitated, but under the blazing eyes of the girl he quickly poured himself a glass of wine and drank a few sips, then flung down the glass. He stepped forward and laid his hands on my shoulders. I winced as he touched the welt of the lash and could not raise my own arm to complete the ceremonial toast. Kiral stepped away and shrugged. "'Shall I have one of the women see to your hurt?' He looked at Dalasa, but she twisted her mouth. "'Do it yourself!' "'It is nothing,' I said, not truthfully. "'But I demand in requital that since we are bound by spilled blood under your roof, that you give me what news you have of recall, the spy and renegade.' Kiral said fiercely, "'If I knew, would I be under my own roof?' The old gaffer on the dais broke into shrill whining laughter. "'You have drunk with him, Kiral. Now he's bound you not to do him harm.' I know the story of Rakal. He was a spy for Terra twelve years. Twelve years! And then he fought and flung their filthy money in their faces and left them. But his partner was some dry-town half-breed or Terran spy, and they fought with clawed gloves, and near killed one another, except the Terrans, who have no honor, stopped him. See the marks of the kafir on his face? By Shara the Golden Chained, said Kiral, gazing at me with something like a grin. You are, if nothing else, a very clever man. What are you, spy, or half-caste of some Ardkaran slut? What I am doesn't matter to you, I said. You have blood feud with Rakal, but mine is older than yours, and his life is mine. As you are bound in honor to kill, the formal phrases came easily now to my tongue, the earthman had slipped away, so you are bound in honor to help me kill, if anyone beneath your roof knows anything of Rakal. Kiral's smile bared his teeth. Rakal works against the son of the ape he said, using the insulting wolf term for the Terrans. If we help you to kill him, we remove a goad from our flanks. I prefer to let the filthy Tyrannans spend their strength trying to remove it themselves. Moreover, I believe you are yourself an Earthman. You have no right to the courtesy I extend to we, the people of the sky, yet you have drunk wine with me, and I have no quarrel with you. He raised his hand in dismissal, outfencing me. Leave my roof in safety, and my city with honor. I could not protest or plead. A man's kirhar, his personal dignity, is a precious thing in Shainsa, and he had placed me so I could not compromise mine further in words. Yet I lost Kirhal equally if I left at his bidding like an inferior dismissed. One desperate gamble remained. A word, I said, raising my hand, and while he half turned, startled, believing I was indeed about to compromise my dignity by a further plea, I flung it at him. I will bet Shegri with you. His iron composure looked shaken. I had delivered a blow to his belief that I was an earthman, for it is doubtful if there are six earthmen on wolf who know about Shegri, the dangerous game of the dry towns. It is no ordinary gamble, for what the better stakes is his life, possibly his reason. Rarely indeed will a man beg Shegri unless he has nothing further to lose. It is a cruel, possibly decadent game, which has no parallel anywhere in the known universe. But I had no choice. I had struck a cold trail in Shainsa. Rakal might be anywhere on the planet, and half of Magnuson's month was already up. Unless I could force Kiral to tell what he knew, I might as well quit. So I repeated, I will bet Shegri with you. And Kiral stood unmoving. For what the Shegrin wagers is his courage and endurance in the face of torture and an unknown fate. On his side, the stakes are clearly determined beforehand. But if he loses, his punishment or penalty is at the whim of the one who has accepted him, and he may be put to whatever doom the winner determines. And this is the contest. The Chagrin permits himself to be tortured from sunrise to sunset. If he endures, he wins. It is as simple as that. He can stop the torture at any moment by a word, but to do so is a concession of defeat. This is not as dangerous as it might at first seem. The other party to the bet is bound by the ironclad codes of Wolf to inflict no permanent physical damage, no injury that will not heal with three sun courses. But from sunrise to sunset, any torment or painful ingenuity which the half-human mentality of Wolf can devise must be endured. The man who can outthink the torture of the moment, the man who can hold in his mind the single thought of his goal, that man can claim the stakes he has set, as well as other concessions made traditional. The silence grew in the hall. Dalisa had straightened and was watching me intently, her lips parted and the tip of a little red tongue visible between her teeth. The only sound was the tiny crunching as the fat woman nibbled at nuts and cast their shells into the brazier. Even the child on the steps had abandoned her game with the crystal dice and sat looking up at me with her mouth open. 
Finally, Kiral demanded, "'Your stakes? Tell me all you know of Rakal Sansar, and keep silence about me and Shane Sa. "'By the Red Shadow!' Kiral burst out. "'You have courage, Raskar!' "'Say only yes or no,' I retorted. Rebuked, he fell silent. Dallas leaned forward, and again, for some unknown reason, I thought of a girl with hair like spun black glass. Kiral raised his hand. "'I say no. I have blood feud with Rakal, and I will not sell his death to another. Further, I believe you are Terran, and I will not deal with you. And finally, you have twice saved my life, and I would find small pleasure in torturing you. I say no. Drink again with me, and we part without a quarrel.' beaten, I turned to go. "'Wait,' said Dalisa. She stood up and came down the dais, slowly this time, walking with dignity to the rhythm of her musically clashing chains. "'I have a quarrel with this man.' I started to say that I did not quarrel with women, and stopped myself. The Terran concept of chivalry has no equivalent on Wolf. She looked at me with her dark, poison-berry eyes, icy and level and amused, and said, "'I will bet Shegri with you, unless you fear me, Raskar.' And I knew suddenly that if I lost, I might better have trusted myself to Kiral and his whip, or to the wild beast things of the mountains. End of chapter 7